Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session entitled um, the uh, 2012 ESC Guidelines Overview. During the next um, period, you will get introduced to the six new guidelines uh, that are produced over the last year by the ESC Guidelines Committee and all the different task forces. My name is Jeroen Baks, I come from Leiden, the Netherlands, and my co-chair is Professor Udo Sechtem from Stuttgart in Germany. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce to you the first speaker who chaired the task force on cardiovascular disease prevention, and he will present his guideline. Joop, please. Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. When we created the session, I thought nobody would, would be in the hall. I'm surprised to see that there are on a Sunday morning 8.30 so many people. It's, it's impressive. I will take you for the next 15 minutes quickly through the new prevention guidelines. This guidelines has been uh, produced by a joint task force with diff nine different societies, and you see here, here them on the slide. It's not only cardiology, it's general practice, hypertension, general, it's uh, the arteriosclerosis society, diabetes specialists, people from behavioral medicine. It's a large, large task force drawing expert, experts from all over Europe. The members of the task force are uh, here on the slide, and I'm particularly indebted to the chapter coordinators, Guy de Bakker, Helmut Golke, Ian Graham, Sales, Elke Ryan and Monique Verschuren, who did a fantastic job in uh, compiling the different chapters and see to the quality of it. Now the problem was, if we looked at the past four documents, this is the fifth time we do this, um, these documents have become larger and larger and larger, and when we draw a line to the level of the fifth, we were not supposed to get, make a um, guideline that would almost be a textbook, so that was not the way to go on. So what we did, we took the whole task force, we locked them up in a lovely little castle in France, and we told them, you won't get out of the room until you have found a new format. So three months later now, or a few days later, we had something different. And then we, what we did, we went back to Plato, the principles of teaching. Plato asked you the questions, what is it are you doing? Why do you do it? For whom do you do it? How do you do it? And where do you do it? And we could uh, transfer that into prevention. What is it? And why do we need it? And for whom is prevention needed? How do you do it and where do you do it? And with this new concept, we were able to make a much shorter guideline that's more adapted to the clinical needs and that is more practical. First question about prevention is, as you can read here, a coordinated set of actions, both at public individual level to uh, eradicate, eliminate, or minimize the impact of cardiovascular disease, and the basis, of course, rooted in cardiovascular epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. Now, why it is needed? I think we all agree that atherosclerotic disease still is the leading cause of premature death. Both men and women, it's before the age of Europe, of um, 75 in Europe, it's 42% of the women die in cardiovascular disease, 38% men. And we've also over the past years shown that the main gains in uh, the, the reductions on COD mortality are related to reductions in the risk factors. Let me take you through the things that are new in these guidelines. One of the main new things is the use of the great evidence rating system. We started off with the conventional ESC methods that you all know of, but the problem with the conventional method is that it doesn't give the right scientific level of um, evidence to the large population studies. It will never be possible to conduct large smoking placebo studies at all. So that's why we went to GREAT, and GREAT has the advantage also to give you a much more practical uh, advice to the clinician. It gives you two recommendations, weak or strong. Strong recommendation means do it. A weak recommendation means, well, you could do it, but you might want to put your money into something else. Some of the major key new key messages I will take you quickly through. We follow the lipid guidelines and work with on the question for whom it is needed with four different levels of cardiovascular risk. And Supported by general practitioners, we, consider, we uh, uh, recommend that once in a lifetime adults should be uh, gone through a risk factor screening moment. 
Uh, we've seen in the literature that there are more populations in Europe, especially in Western and Central Europe, that are now at cardiovascular risk. In my area, in Scandinavia, all of the countries are at low cardiovascular risk, which is the good news. We've had problems in convincing patients to change lifestyle. If you change your score level from 5 to 3 percent, it's not very convincing. So we are introducing a risk age concept, which will make it easier to convince patients that they can become younger by changing life habits. Over the years, the importance of psychosocial factors has been strengthened, but the role of the new biomarkers is still quite limited. There is much new knowledge to be gained on passive smoking and it's in the guidelines also. We have also a chapter on the dietary patterns and on the multimodal behavior interventions. On blood pressure, uh, one of the key messages here is don't give patients only drugs. You work with lifestyle measures. Lifestyle counseling is a part of your treatment of the, of the hypertensive patients. And we leave it up to the clinicians to decide themselves which medication they want to use. We do not give any specific medications uh, recommendations. They are equal for clinical use. That's what we state. The target blood pressure is 140 over 90. And there are in these guidelines now uh, threshold value values even for what we recommend more often, home and measurement by the patients themselves. For diabetes, the target ABA1C uh, level is here presented at 7%, 53 millimole per mole, and the blood pressure in diabetes, after, after a lot of discussion, uh, ended up at the 140 over 80 level. For lipids, um, we still use LDL cholesterol as our target for lipid treatment with 1.8 for the very high risk patient or a reduction of at least 50% from the starting value if you can't get that low. We look at the people at very high risk, any sign of uh, cardiovascular disease will put you in the highest risk group. But even diabetes, there is no distinction between, between type 1 and 2. When you have risk factors or tar target organ damage, you are in the highest risk group. Severe chronic kidney disease is there, and a very high score of 10% or higher is also at high risk, very high risk. If we look at the high risk group, these are people with marked single risk factor elevations, diabetics without any target organ damage or risk, other risk factors, chronic, mild chronic disease, and a score between 5 and 10. And then at moderate risk is what we find among the major part of the adult population, a score between uh, 1 and 5 percent, and a very small group of people at very low, at low risk, the score below 1 percent. In the risk age concept, um, eagerly um, um, uh, adhered by from Professor Graham, uh, we have it now on board. And what we do here is that we take the values on smoking, on blood pressure, on, on cholesterol for your actual patient and compare it with the level of a person with, very, with normal levels of blood pressure and cholesterol. And in this example, you can see that a guy here, he was 40 year old. Actually, if you look, compare him with a person at normal risk, he is already 60 year old. And it might be a good way of convincing your patient that you can do something which you have is to become younger in your vessels. This is also at our website that you see now available in a digital version. What is completely new in our document is where the uh, program sh should be offered. We felt it necessary to give guidance on who is going to do what. And uh, what we then state in the first place is that prevention is a lifelong activity. It's from early childhood into later age. I'm particularly pleased to see that there is now sufficient evidence to show that nurse-coordinated programs are a part of healthcare in preventive programs, and especially in primary care, this should be a thing that could be extended rightly. It's of course clear that after PCI you need guideline oriented treatment and we also state here but with a slightly lower level of evidence that after an acute cardiac event uh, we recommend that patients enter programs that can help them to change lifestyle like cardiac rehabilitation programs. A few other key messages in this last chapter. We think that uh, the general practitioner is still one of the real key persons to initiate, to coordinate, coordinate to, to continue on the long-term follow-up of prevention. But there are a lot of private cardiologists out there that can be uh, um, advising our general practitioners to do the right thing.
When we ask over 1,000 post-PCI patients in Sweden, we have that on the poster uh, tomorrow, uh, what kind of help they seek themselves, we are surprised that 40% themselves outside healthcare go to the internet, go to the web and try to find knowledge there. So we find here that the different self-help programs, we need to look deeper into that because there is an interest from the patient to use them. And we would also like to underline that non-governmental organizations, heart foundations, are important um, um, partners to work with in the preventive practice. And at the very last part of our guidelines, we have a few lines on the important initiative on the EU level, an initiative, initiative that will put preventive cardiology more on the front page of, of the politicians. So what we have available at the moment here are on our website the, the document, we have the CME questions, there's a slide set, there are key messages. We've also asked all our contributors to tell us what do you feel is still missing, what are the major gaps in evidence. For those of you that do not know what kind of science you want to, to be active in, look at the major gaps in evidence, you will get a lot of uh, ideas or things that you could put your research in. One thing which is completely new, um, coming from Sweden with the IKEA furniture company, the leader there says if you want to get any message across you have to write it down on half a piece of paper. And that's what we've done with the prevention guideline is the IKEA model. We have a one page summary of everything and we hope this one page summary will end up on the desk of every general practitioner around Europe. You will find it in the ESC booth and I recommend you to look at it where you can also find the pocket version. Well, that, this was a very short summary of three years of work. We, I'm very pleased with the fact that we are ready with it and I'm pleased with the final content and the opportunity to present it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joop, for this introduction and sharing with us on the prevention guideline. The next presentation is going to be given by John McMurray from Glasgow. He chaired the task force uh, composing the new guideline on acute and chronic heart failure. John, not quite three years, I remember. <laughs> Thank you very much, Udo. Uh, well, I'm very proud to present uh, the heart failure guideline on behalf of the 26 members of our task force and on behalf of all of these other people who work remarkably hard in helping produce the final product that you've seen published, in particular thanks go to our two co-chairs and uh, Theresa McDonough, who was the other coordinator for the Heart Failure Guideline, and all the reviewers. This is an outline of what I'll cover in this short presentation. I want to say something about um, something we did in terms of linking evidence and recommendations. I'll briefly summarize all the new evidence we had to review. I'll say something about the main changes in this guideline compared to the previous one. Uh, I'll focus there on chronic heart failure. Then I'll say something very briefly about acute heart failure. Most of what I'm going to talk about is treatment because that's where most of the new developments have been. I'll also finish by mentioning diagnosis. You're all familiar with the, uh, what I think is wonderful ESC style of presenting recommendations. We tried to take that a little bit further by linking the recommendation to the effect of the treatment. And the reason we did this is, for example, there were some treatments that have a 1A recommendation because there are two trials that show, show that they lower pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, for example, nitrates. And yet we have other drugs, for example, beta blockers, which reduce mortality, and there are several trials showing that. And it seemed wrong to us that both of those uh, treatments got a class 1 level A recommendation without qualification uh, about that treatment effect. So you can see in this slide the style of the recommendations in our guideline. For example, ACE inhibitors are given to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and the risk of premature mortality. And we also tried to do this for our diagnostic recommendations to say why you do the test, what value is the test to you in terms of diagnosis, monitoring, selecting patients for treatment, and so on. 
What new evidence did we have to assess? Well, as I said, most of that was to do with treatment, and there were a lot of trials. In fact, there were 19 new large randomized trials that had been published between 2008 and 2011 12. These are the treatments, uh, new, new treatment, uh, drug treatment trials. Uh, there were trials in HEFPEF as well as HEFREF. There were device studies, and of course, there was some new and interesting information about surgical interventions. So we had 19 large trials to review, including some in acute heart failure. And there were a couple of lifestyle intervention trials as well. So the main changes uh, concerning treatment in the 2008 guideline are from the 2008 guideline are summarized on this slide. As you can see, there was an expanded indication for mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists in the 2012 guideline. There's a new indication for the sinus node inhibitor ivabradine. There's an expanded indication for cardiac resynchronization therapy. These last two uh, were to some extent controversial, so I'll uh, spend a few minutes discussing those uh, in the next few slides. We incorporated the new information about coronary revascularization in systolic heart failure. I think we've recognized the growing evidence for and use of ventricular assist devices, and largely we also recognized the emergence of transcatheter valve interventions. We summarized uh, the therapeutic approach to patients with systolic heart failure in a new algorithm, which is shown in this slide. Uh, one of the things I would say to you is if you look at this algorithm, please also read the footnotes and accompanying text. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about the algorithm, but most of them are addressed in the text. This shows you the start of the algorithm, the initial pharmacological therapy, recognizing the expanded role for mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and that is accompanied by the uh, evidence recommendations in a table that we now have that says these three treatments should be considered potentially in all patients with systolic heart failure. This is the next part of the treatment algorithm and this is the bit that caused a lot of discussion which was the role of and place of ivabradine as a treatment for heart failure, a new treatment since the 2008 guideline. And we placed ivabradine along with a number of other treatments in a different table where we uh, said that these are drugs that we were less certain about the benefits of and they were to be considered for more selected groups of patients with heart failure. As I said, ivabradine was a particular point of discussion and we had to word the recommendation, I think, very carefully indeed to take account of all the reviewers' comments and so on, and that's summarised on the slide, and I, I won't read it out, but I think we tried to recognise all the issues. The other big development, I think, in ther therapeutics since the 2008 guideline was the expanded indication for CRT, and you can see how this appears in the algorithm on the slide in front of you, and of course, what we now know is that CRT is beneficial even in patients with systolic heart failure and mild symptoms. We are, I think, pretty certain about that in patients with a left bundle branch block morphology who are in sinus rhythm. We're less certain about other patients with non-left bundle branch block and certainly about patients in atrial fibrillation. So this expanded indication was based on made it CRT and RAFT. The controversial part was um, whether or not there was an indication for CRT in patients who don't have left bundle branch block. This meta-analysis suggests that 
CRT probably is beneficial still in patients with severely symptomatic heart failure who don't have left bundle branch block, have right bundle branch block or a non-specific conduction delay. But there is controversy about patients with milder symptoms who don't have left bundle branch block. Do they get benefit from CRT and should we recommend CRT in those patients? Well, in fact, we found that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration had done a very nice and detailed analysis of these two new CRT trials, which suggested that there may well be benefit in patients with uh, right bundle branch block or a non-specific conduction delay if their QRS duration is still prolonged if, it, if their QRS duration is still 150 milliseconds or greater. And that is reflected in the recommendation that we made in this guideline, though as you can see it is not as strong as for patients with left bundle branch block. As I said, we also recognised the uh, increased role for surgical coronary revascularization based on the STITCH study and our recommendation really reflects more or less exactly the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the STITCH trial. We also recognise the growing use of ventricular assist devices giving these a class 1 recommendation as a bridge to transplant and a less uh, strong recommendation as destination therapy in highly selected patients with end-stage heart failure. I'll say very little about acute heart failure because there wasn't really much new that would change clinical practice. And what we really did with this part of the guideline was we shortened it and I hope improved it with the use of two new algorithms one explaining really how you approach a patient with suspected acute heart failure and how you have that difficult task of almost simultaneously trying to assess and treat the patient at the same time. We also have a new treatment algorithm. It's a bit hard to see on this slide. This is just the top part of it, but it takes you through, I think, the key things that decide how you manage these patients their blood oxygen concentration and their blood pressure being particularly key assessments in deciding what treatment interventions to use. There wasn't a lot new in diagnosis. We did restructure that part of the guideline. Um, there was really nothing that I think changed the guideline significantly from 2008 though the emphasis on different investigations did change a bit. For example, we felt there was more evidence uh, that CMR has an important uh, part to play in the diagnosis of at least selected patients with heart failure. Clearly, CT, coronary angiography, and so on have become more important. So this was more about emphasis rather than any major change in practice. We also created a new diagnostic uh, guide, uh, diagnostic algorithm reflecting the two approaches used in practice, one an echocardiography based approach and the other a natriuretic peptide based, based approach. Like the last speaker, we also recognise that we still have an awful lot to learn. Uh, there were some areas that we felt that even though there's been a lot of work they remained uncertain and two, I would pick out our remote monitoring and serial measurement of natriuretic peptides. We also thought there are many gaps in evidence which we have highlighted in our documents. We've also published a pocket guideline which is available at this meeting. And very importantly, we have uh, an online supplement which describes not just what drugs you should use, but actually practically how to use those drugs. And we focused on diuretics and the three key disease-modifying drugs, i.e. ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. And these appendices give you a step-by-step -step approach to the use of these drugs. So that's my summary of the heart failure guidelines. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. A great guideline and a nice summary, and I can only recommend everybody to go to the web and look at these um, practical recommendations. They're really excellent, but we didn't have the space for it in the guideline itself, but it's worth reading and applying it. Then it's uh, time for the uh, third guideline. As you have probably recognized, we have changed the uh, publication schedule a little bit this year, and we will keep doing that in the new years to come. That means we spread the guidelines release a little bit over the year, that some will be presented at subspecialty meetings. This one to come has not been presented anywhere and is completely new. This is the first presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stefan James from Uppsala in Sweden to share with you acute myocardial infarction in patients presenting with ST segment elevation infarction. Stefan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure and privilege, uh, together with my co-chair, Gabriel Stegg, to present the guidelines of the management of patients with uh, ST elevation myocardial infarctions. These are my potential conflicts of interest and my co-chairman's conflicts of interest. I want to acknowledge the 23 members of the task force committee representing different areas of expertise from clinical cardiology, interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, imaging, arrhythmia, heart failure, secondary prevention, nursing, etc and also the ESC Guideline Committee, and, and also the 19 members of the Official Reviewer Committee who substantially contributed to the quality of these guidelines. We have reviewed the literature and classified the evidence according to the standard ESC uh, recommendations, uh, giving a class one recommendations to therapies that have a strong evidence supported by uh, more than two, two or more uh, randomized clinical trials and suggested that these tr treatments are recommended or indicated something you should do. And furthermore, in class 2A, uh, strong evidence supported by at least one randomized tr prospective uh, tr trial, a therapy that should be considered as class 2B, something that may be considered, and finally c class 3, where there is poor evidence and something that should not be performed. Thus, we have reviewed the literature and we have agreed to give 100, in total 157 uh, individual recommendations. As you can see on this pie chart, most of those recommendations are class one recommendations, 96 of them. Uh, 36 of them are class 2A recommendations and 13 are 2B recommendations. We have intentionally tried to avoid unnecessary class three recommendations, but we have included them if we thought there's good evidence to recommend some uh, therapy, uh, recommend against a therapy, uh, or if we thought that there is a need to recommend, to recommend against a therapy because it may be considered or may be performed in different institutions in Europe. As compared to the previous guidelines from 2008, you can see that we have added uh, almost 20 recommendations. Most of them, most of the increase is within class one recommendations but we've also added three class three recommendations. We've also leveled the uh, evidence according to the standard recommendations of level of evidence A, B, and C, depending on the quality of the documentation from randomized trials or only C consensus um, recommendation. Thus, for the 157 recommendations, we base our recommendations on 346 references. As you can see, level of evidence A in 33, 21%, 55 of them evidence B, and 69 level of evidence C. And compared to the previous set of guidelines, you can see there's a similar share between uh, level of evidence A, B, and C, but there are now numerically more uh, level of evidence A in these guidelines. So there's still a remaining need for research and update uh, in the future of these guidelines. So what is new? Uh, we have expanded many sections. For early diagnosis, we have included more atypical presentations. For cardiac arrest, we have expanded the recommendations and included the role of hypothermia and angiography. For pre-hospital logistics of care, we have included the role of pre-hospital diagnosis, triage, and network. Uh, reperfusion strategies has been modified, and we strongly recommend 
to monitor and uh, uh, report time delays, and we've included angiography post fibrinolysis. We give PCI strategies, we give specific stent recommendations, and we've changed the antithrombotic therapy recommendations. Regarding routine therapies and strategies, we have included duration of hospital stay, secondary prevention, duration of antithrombotic therapy, evaluation of LV function and viability. So going into the guidelines for cardiac arrest, I just want to highlight that we give four class one recommendations to have access to defibrillators, to, to perform ECGG monitoring as soon as possible after the first medical, medical contact, to give uh, hypothermia, to perform angiography uh, for patients uh, with resuscitated cardiac arrest and ST elevation myocardial infarction, but also as a 2A recommendation to perform angiography to, with a view to primary PCI in patients with cardiac arrest without diagnostic EKG changes, but with a high clinical suspicion of ongoing myocardial infarction. In this figure, we have tried to define the time intervals that you should measure, monitor, and report. We try here to specify the acceptable time limits from the first medical contact to the diagnosis of ST elevation myocardial infarction. We define the patient delay and the system delay, and the most, most importantly, the total time to reperfusion therapy, whether or not it's primary PCI or fibrinolysis. Uh, here we give a, uh, this chart we recommend how you should perform, evaluate the patients from the diagnosis of ST elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, if patients are uh, at, in, a, in an environment where there is a PCI capable center, PCI should be performed preferably within 60 minutes. Uh, if patients uh, seek attention in an emergency, emergency situation or in a non-primary PCI hospital, uh, the, the, the maximal uh, de uh, delay that, uh, that accepts uh, PCI is 120 minutes. If you cannot make that, you should uh, go for fibrinolysis. That should be performed preferably within 30 minutes. If it's possible to perform PCI within 120 minutes, you should immediately transfer the patient to that PCI center. And the recommended maximal delay here is 90 minutes, not to uh, uh, to not to um, uh, mix up with the 120 minute delay, which is acceptable for primary PCI versus fibrinolysis. In early presenters, we recommend a shorter delay of 60 minutes. Rescue PCI should be performed if, if uh, fibrinolysis has failed, but if fibrinolysis is successful, we recommend coronary angiography with a view to primary PCI within 3 to 24 minutes. The acceptable delay, delays are here defined. Uh, the preferred delay from first medical contact to EKG is 10, 10 minutes. Preferred delay from first medical contact to fibrinolysis, 30 minutes. From FMC to primary PCI in a primary PCI hospital, that's 60 minutes. Preferred delay from first medical contact to, to, to primary PCI is 90 minutes, as, as I said, 60 minutes for early presenters. The acceptable for primary PCI rather than fibrinolysis is 120 minutes and 90 minutes if it's an early presenter with large area at risk. And the preferred uh, delay for uh, angiography from a successful fibrinolysis is 3 to 24 uh, hours. Uh, with that, I hand over to my co-chair, Gabriel. Thank you. Uh, I will not bore you with the detail of every single table in the document, which is very long, but we thought we would highlight some of the key features that are novel in the document. So clearly, as in the previous version, reperfusion is indicated for all patients presenting within 12 hours of symptoms with ST elevation or presumed new LBBB. We have also accepted reperfusion therapy in patients who have evidence of ongoing ischemia or in whom pain and EKG changes have been stuttering. We've accepted that PCI may be considered in stable patients presenting 12 to 24 hours after symptom onset with a grade 2BB recommendation. And finally, on the basis of the OAT trial and a couple of uh, meta-analyses of smaller trials performed in the literature, we've recommended against routine PCI of a totally occluded artery more than 24 hours after symptom onset in stable patients without signs of ischemia, and every single word in that sentence counts.
With respect to the procedural aspects of primary PCI, stenting is recommended. Primary PCI should be limited to the culprit vessel, with the exception of cardiogenic shock and persistent ischemia after PCI of the supposed culprit lesion. Recognizing the results of the rival randomized trial, we've recommended that radial access should be preferred over femoral access if performed by an experienced radial operator. With respect to the ch choice of DES over BMS, the task force recommends that if the patient has no contraindication to prolonged debt and is likely to be compliant, DES should be preferred over BMS. Routine thrombus aspiration should be considered. Routine use of distal protection devices is not recommended, as is not recommended the routine use of intraortic balloon pump in patients without shock. What about antiplatelet therapy? Aspirin is recommended. An ADP receptor blocker is recommended. But clearly, clopidogrel has been downgraded, and the novel agents are preferred. Prosugrel in clopidogrel naive patients, if no history of prior stroke TIA, and an age below 75 years, and orticagulol. Clopidogrel is to, you, to be used preferably when prasugrel or ticagulol are either not available or contraindicated. GP2B3 inhibitors have a grade two recommendation. Bailout therapy has a 2AC recommendation. Routine use of a GPI as an adjunct to primary PCI performed with unfractionate heparin may be considered in patients without contraindications and largely on the basis of the on time to trial upstream use of a gpi may be considered in high risk patients that are under, that are undergoing transfer for primary pci we then recognize that the level of evidence may vary according to the agent with more evidence available for epsiximab than for eptifibatide or tirofiban but for eptifibatide and tirofiban we recommended specific regimens with respect to anticoagulant therapy, clearly an injectable anticoagulant must be used with a grade one recommendation. But the order in which the recommendation has been done is important. Bavarudin, with the use of GPI restricted to bailout, is recommended over infractionate heparin and GPI with a grade one B recommendation. Inoxaparin may be preferred over infractionate heparin with a grade two B recommendation. And infractionate heparin with or without a routine GPI is now a clear third choice and is limited to patients who are not receiving bivalorudin or inoxaparin. Fondaparinox is not recommended for primary PCI on the basis of the OASIS-6 trial and the use of lysis before planned primary PCI is not recommended. What about routine long-term therapies at discharge in the subacute discharge and long-term phase of STEMI? Dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and an oral ADP receptor antagonist must be continued for up to 12 months after STEMI, grade 1C recommendation. We, however, recognize that there may be need or circumstances in which the duration of antiplatelet therapy must be considered to be shortened if intercurrent events occur or procedures are required. And therefore, we highlighted a strict minimum of one month for patients receiving bare metal stents, grade 1C, and six months for patients receiving drug eluting stents largely on the basis of the Prodigy trial, grade 2BB. In patients with left ventricular thrombus, anticoagulation for three months must be instituted, should be instituted, and for patients with a clear indication for oral anticoagulations, anticoagulation, it must be implemented in addition to antiplatelet therapy. Now, if a patient requires triple antithrombotic therapy, combining dual antiplatelet therapy and oral anticoagulation, such as stent placement and, and atrial fibrillation, for instance, the task force recommends that the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy should be minimized to reduce bleeding risk. Following the ATLAS-2 trial, the role of rivaroxaban has been defined as may, a, a drug that may be considered in selected patients who receive aspirin and clopidogrel if the patient is at a low bleeding risk. A PPI for gastric protection should be considered in patients at high risk of bleeding for the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And finally, with respect to oral agents, while oral treatment with beta blockers is still a grade 1A recommendation in patients with heart failure or, or LV dysfunction, all beta blockers have been somewhat downgraded to a grade 2AB recommendation for routine therapy in all STEMI patients.
There are far more uh, uh, recommendations and discussions in the uh, complete document that is now available online, including gaps in evidence and areas for future research. In conclusion, I would like to thank the members of the task force and also highlight two special thanks to Dr. David Hasdai, who had the formidable tasks, task of coordinating the thousands, literally thousands, of comments that we received from the reviewers and the staff at the ESC, Veronica Dean and her team, who were provided invaluable uh, help throughout the uh, uh, writing of these guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel and Stefan, for producing an excellent guideline on STEMI. The uh, fourth guideline that we are going to discuss is not really a guideline, it is the third edition of the definition of myocardial infarction and this is a uh, co-production of the ESC with uh, the Americans and therefore we have two chairpersons who are also going to present today, that's Christian Tigerson from Aarhus and Joe Alpert from Tucson. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we now today will present the update of the universal definition of myocardial infarction, and I will take the first part of it, and my uh, co-chairman from the very beginning, uh, Professor Joe Albert, will go more in detail with, with the classification. As you know, we started uh, what we could call the RIF definition of myocardial infarction back in year 2000, where there was a collaborative effort between the ESC and the American College of Cardiology, where we took over a more biochemical approach to define acute myocardial infarction in contrast to the older World Health Organization uh, definition where they have the more ECD approach because at that time it was indicated uh, mostly for epidemiology but also uh, used by clinicians. But there was some lack in the acute phase and also because at that time the uh, new sensitive and specific marker troublings arrived to the arena. This uh, document at that time called the ESC ACC criteria was used uh, a little bit reluctant by clinicians but after a while they uh, took it over and then we could see that it was necessary to have an update and we convened again in 2007 at that time the American Heart Association and the uh, World Heart Federation joined us so that was really a joint, joint effort and therefore we called now the document document for universal definition of myocardial infarction. This also was accepted and endorsed by World Health Organization in 2010 and 2011. There was a publication on that. But each time when you come up with a new document, there will always be questions and uh, there will also be new tools in the, in the clinics, new diagnostics. So it was a time again to uh, restart the process and we convened again and this time it was 52 members of the task force from the, all the uh, four mentioned organizations and uh, we have worked since then for four to five years on that matter and today we have the results. Well, what is new, what is not new? We have, of course, kept the pathological uh, definition of myocardial infarction means that you should have the two components, ischemia, myocardial ischemia, and myocardial necrosis. And if that had together, you had to call it myocardial infarct. That is, of course, not changed. So it's important to have the two components all the time, necrosis, marker necrosis, and symptoms or markers of ischemia. And therefore, we have, uh, we have kept what we come up with in uh, 2000 and 2007, that you should use uh, first uh, and foremost a uh, biochemical marker, and we recommend the troponin, and uh, also recommend still that there should be about a level of 99th percentile, and also you should have precise uh, measurements, so you should have a coefficient of variation less than 10 percent. Then, uh, in addition to this uh, marker on necrosis, you should have some symptoms of ischemia and or you should have uh, uh, signs in ECD 
and or uh, imaging technique. And here also we now have added a new one because I should have in fact have been there all the time but uh, it was not there. Of course if you can uh, identify a fresh thrombus both by angiography or by autopsy that could also be called uh, by myocardial infarction of course. Still, we recommend the use of uh, troponins, the cardiac troponins, including the new high sensitivity troponins, which now is on the market in Europe, in most in common in Europe. Not, I don't think it's not all countries, but many countries, but not uh, still on the market in the United States. But we have been very uh, broad, just talked about cardiac troponins, uh, so they can still be used, the other ones. Well, of course, if they are not uh, have access to use troponin, it's uh, still acceptable to use the older, uh, less specific and less sensitive markers, uh, CK and CKMB mass. Well, uh, you should have an elevation of the cardiac markers, uh, uh, troponins, uh, before you can call something for myocardial infarct. But that is something uh, a little bit confusing because there could be many other conditions where you can have injury and you should not call everything for myocardial infarct. I think that will be a little bit the problem in the past that the, perhaps we have too many myocardial infarction where it's, uh, even it's not a myocardial infarction, but there is some damage or some injury of the myocardial cells and there could be very many other conditions uh, uh, for that uh, and uh, we know that uh, very much for the clinic. And also here, and uh, Professor Albert come back to the myocardial infarction type 2, where you do not necessarily uh, have a thrombus. So that is listed in the document, all the different scenarios or conditions where you could uh, have an elevation of troponins that, that does not necessarily mean that you have myocardial infarct. We are going more in depth, and this is very new, we are going more in depth trying to explain what, what is it about. So if you have some uh, injury to the cell, it can go from you have uh, this for myocardial injury and you can have more and more uh, cell death. If that is in the setting of the uh, ischemia, you will call it infarct, but if it's not in, in the setting of ischemia, you should just call it injury. And we're trying to illustrate then if there are other conditions where there could be renal failure, heart failure, uh, cardiac procedure, non-cardiac procedure, you could have some elevation in the condition of ischemia. You may call it myocardial infarction, but in most cases it's not myocardial infarction, it's injury through the myocardium, and then you could call myocardial injury, or perhaps it's no injury at all, and then you should not call it anything in the context of the heart. So that that's will be new in, in the documents. That is also, it's not new, but we have uh, elaborated that, that table it was in the previous one, but we have expanded a little bit more on that, and especially here all added what we call uh, type 4C, because some, uh, in some clinical trials that has been used as an, an, an endpoint, that is the restenosis, uh, uh, but that was a lot of discussion about that because the interventionalists, uh, in fact, don't, uh, they say, they don't see it so much and they will not agree that it should be a, a special type. Uh, some cl uh, clinical trialists think that was important, uh, so it was added after long discussion. I have also here to add that we was in close uh, contact with Food and Drug Administration during the process, so they will, uh, I, I guess, they will take over the definition we have set up now and that will be a requirement for the future clinical trials. So that way it will be and be a very uh, important uh, document. We have also uh, in, the, in the document going into areas where it is difficult to uh, diagnose myocardial infarction or myocardial injury. Uh, that could be other procedures than cabbage or PCI, for example, TAVI, mitral clip, and, and for ablation, uh, and where we, we discuss uh, in a section how to define myocardial infarction. We have done the same with a heart, with, with a higher type of uh, surgery, uh, where you, we know very well from the clinic that the uh, myocardial infarction can occur, but 
that could also just be another myocardial injury. We have a section about how to define myocardial infarction in an intensive care unit, and uh, also uh, how to uh, try to uh, diagnose myocardial infarction in the context of heart failure. That is, we know, is really difficult. And there is a special uh, paper on that. It's now is online on the European Heart Journal. You can find it there where they specific, uh, the, the subcommittee on heart failure of uh, our task force wrote a special paper on, on that on the heart line. The third definition of myocardial infarction is now uh, uh, is, uh, will be published or presented in five uh, the major journal, and that is really a great uh, achievement. I've th- never seen that before, so that has been uh, been accepted and, be, and published in European Heart Journal, in Circulation, in DIAC, and in the Global Heart and Natural Reviews of Cardiology. The two last journals is of uh, is of World Health uh, Federation. It was uh, on online uh, yesterday, you will find it there, and um, they will also appear in the pocket guideline, and there will be at hard copies of the, all the media journal there in about, uh, uh, simultaneously about the 1st of October, you can look it up there. So that was the first part, so now I'll leave the uh, microphone for my co-chairman, Professor Albert. This one, right? Oops. Yeah, yeah easy. Got, got it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. I want to uh, say thank you to the members of the ESC, uh, to my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Trusen, uh, with whom I have been working on this project now for 14 years. It began at a dinner uh, in Atlanta, Georgia in the late uh, 20th century when we were talking about conflicts between uh, results in clinical trials and discovered that a lot of it had to do with the fact that the definition of myocardial infarction varied from trial to trial. And we talked about how in our own hospitals the definition changed from one clinician to another. That was the initial factor that led uh, to the first and second and now third document. Um, I am personally, as well as the task force, tremendously grateful to Veronica Dean. I don't think uh, uh, any of these guidelines would happen without her intelligent and and, uh, huge effort. Uh, And uh, I'm very grateful uh, for my ability to uh, work with her as well. Well, uh, you've heard uh, that uh, we uh, keep tightening up uh, the definition, um, uh, trying to eliminate uh, patients who are not uh, having myocardial necrosis secondary to ischemia. Uh, This is uh, an area of considerable consternation and confusion to many clinicians. We're going to be having two more papers uh, during this uh, session where we'll be discussing this topic, but I'm sure most of you will go home still uh, having problems uh, in your daily clinical work or in your clinical investigations defining type 2 myocardial infarction uh, as opposed to myocardial injury. And there is a lot more work going on in this area and hopefully in the future um, it will be a little uh, clearer. Um, Just uh, potential conflicts of interest. Um, this, uh, uh, of course, will not be a, you will not be able to read this from the back, uh, but this is in the document. And again, um, it defines uh, the five types of myocardial infarction that we've been uh, uh, using since the second document in 2007. The type 1 that I like to refer to in quotes as the wild type from Drosophila genetics. It's the patient who has uh, usually had a ruptured or fissured plaque with a thrombus in the coronary who presents Uh, uh, with the typical uh, findings of an acute myocardial infarction. Just uh, uh, the last guidelines, uh, uh, often these patients have STEMIs or non-STEMIs. The type 2 myocardial infarction is the one that's been most controversial. In these patients, uh, individuals, some even without uh, obvious angiographic coronary disease, a marked increase in myocardial oxygen demand, let's say from a tachycardia, uh, uh, or a a marked decrease in myocardial oxygen uh, supply, for example, hypotension secondary to sepsis and a 
variety of other things, can lead to ischemia in the myocardium followed by necrosis, and therefore it's a myocardial infarction, but it's not one due to the usual pathophysiology that we think of, that is fissuring and th- uh, or rupture of a plaque uh, with thrombosis in the coronary artery. Type 3 is a relatively small area. It's individuals who um, present with typical findings uh, that you think is going to go down the road to a type 1 myocardial infarction, uh, but then they either die early or the laboratory breaks the tube that uh, contained the blood sample for troponin, so there was no troponin, but where all the clinical information obviously says this was an acute MI. For example, there was ST elevation and appropriate symptoms and, or angiographic evidence of a, of a thrombus. It's a very small number. The type 4, as uh, Professor Tuzan has just uh, mentioned, um, continues to have some controversy, uh, uh, particularly among our invasive colleagues. Um, in the first document, we said any elevation in troponin after a PCI was an acute MI. Uh, the problem there was that it meant perhaps a third of the patients that went to the lab had had an, had an MI uh, secondary to the procedure. As you can imagine, that met with uh, very little approval from our uh, invasive colleagues. And uh, uh, the, the next document, we said you had to have uh, uh, three times the elevation um, in troponin uh, uh, in order for it not to be an, uh, uh, an unavoidable injury related to the procedure, but not an MI. Uh, greater than uh, five is now the number in the latest document, and that's based on uh, some new prognostic information from long-term follow-ups of patients undergoing PCI. The same with respect to uh, following coronary bypass. The first document, we had almost no data, no studies. In in the most recent... uh, uh, document, uh, we've gone up to 10 times. We were five times in 2007. We're now 10 times because, again, there is unavoidable injury to the heart from needle sticks uh, and handling of the heart and, and uh, the myocardial preservation procedure. And these are not really ischemic uh, uh, pathophysiologic events. Uh, they are uh, mechanical or uh, usually mechanical or, or handling uh, uh, things with the heart, and therefore the, we d- uh, designate them as myocardial injuries. Very briefly then, uh, uh, just to show you some uh, little cartoons, here's the type 1 myocardial infarction, uh, spontaneous, related to plaque rupture, fissuring, or dissection, with resulting intraluminal thrombus, um, and leading, of course, to decreased blood flow and ischemic myocardial necrosis. Here's the one that's been most controversial. We talked, I talked about that just a moment ago, the one where there's marked increase in uh, uh, myocardial oxygen demand or decrease in myocardial oxygen supply due to a whole variety of things, anemia, arrhythmias, respiratory failure, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, um, this uh, one has to be uh, distinguished from myocardial injuries secondary to increased uh, levels of circulating catecholamines and cytokines, uh, what I like to refer to to the residents as evil humors that uh, injure the heart but are not due to ischemia. The type 3 we've already talked about, the individual who for one reason or another didn't get a troponin or died before we could get a troponin, it's a very small number. Here is again the controversial. This is the type 4A. This is the one that occurs in relationship to the procedure itself Um, and as you can see it has to be due to greater than five times the 99th percentile upper limit uh, of uh, normal. Um, The type 4B is due to late stent thrombosis. Uh, That's where it's clear from the angiography that there's been a thrombosis. And the type 4C that was referred to uh, by Professor Tuzan just a few moments ago was one that our uh, clinical investigative colleagues wanted because they said when they sat on endpoint committees, they saw patients who didn't have thrombus, they were post-PCI some months later, but indeed they did have uh, restenosis, uh, appropriate symptoms, and elevated troponin. So that's a, a type 4C. There's not a thrombus but there is restenosis with infarction. And then the type 5 um, is going to be moved up to 10 times because of unavoidable small injuries to the myocardium that uh, are normally seen uh, during uh, the operation. So um, we hope everybody will read this. We want everybody in the world to use this definition. The, the day that, that uh, Kristen and I are looking forward to is the day when a patient in Tokyo has a myocardial infarct and it will be defined the same way as a patient in Copenhagen or a patient in Paris or a patient in Tel Aviv or a patient in Tucson, Arizona. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you.
Thank you very much, um, the team from Denmark and the US. So the next guideline to be presented is the one on valvular heart disease. As you've seen, um, since these guidelines become more and more complex and the logistics are becoming more and more complex, we have chosen to expand most of the guidelines to two chairs. So for the valvular heart disease, it's a joint guideline between our surgical colleagues and the ESC and is chaired by um, Professor Alec Vanyan from Paris in France and by Professor Ottavio Viri from Bridge and Italy. The first part will be presented by Dr. Vanyan and the second part by Dr. Alfieri. Alec, please. Okay, thank you, dear chairman, dear colleagues. Don't be afraid, it won't be complex. We are only dealing with valve disease. So it's a joint effort between ESC and ESCTS, and Otavio and myself are very pleased, firstly, to show our disclosures and then to present the document. So we would like also to start by thanking the members of the task force. We met in a French castle, but it was much smaller than the castle used for prevention. But the atmosphere was extremely friendly and productive. We would like also to thank Yaron and the CPG, and of course Veronica and all the team and the reviewers who did a great job. So why do we need guidelines, new guidelines, after the 207 issue? Because there is new evidence, even in this field, and on risk classification, diagnostic methods, mostly on therapeutic options. But the key message, the core of a document, is to stress the teamwork. And it is run by two societies, but it means that there should be a hard team approach between cardiologists and cardiac surgeons when treating patients with valve disease, especially if they are high risk. It is one of the merit of the TAVI, but we did follow what was done for coronary disease. Let's say a word about patient evaluation. This slide may seem a little bit simplistic, but I think we should always recall that we have to go stepwise when we assess a patient before valve intervention. Is valve disease severe? We have to look at the recommendation from the EAE. Does the patient have symptoms? Stress the patient, if any doubt, do exercise echo if it is affordable. Now, we are dealing with very elderly patients, often patients with many comorbidity. And the question is, are they suffering from symptoms related to valve disease or to another disease? What is their life expectancy? What is their expected quality of life? And we are dealing with patients, so we should balance the risk and benefit of intervention and not refuse intervention because the risk of surgery is high, but we should not forget the natural history. We should listen to the patient and know what is possible on site and refer to the patient to a specialized center for valve repair, for example. As regards the scoring to assess risk, there is no magic number. And the task force strongly stressed the fact that we have to assess it as a team using firstly the clinical judgment in addition to a combination of score. Let's be more specific. Arctic regurge. Clearly, as in 207, when we are dealing with such a patient, look at the ascending aorta. If it's not dilated, AR is severe, exactly the same as 207. But if the ascending aorta is dilated, we thought that we should change the threshold for intervention based on recent study of natural history. For patients with Marfan, where we have some data, it seems uh, acceptable to intervene only if the maximal diameter is 50 mm and for patients who have Marfan plus risk factors, rapid progression, family history, you can intervene at 45 and for bicuspid the threshold is 50. But there is no magic number. We should combine measurements using different tools. We should adapt. If you replace the aortic valve, threshold can be lower. If you repair more than replace, threshold can be lower. Aortic stenosis. The big piece in these guidelines, to the first time that TAVI is introduced in official guidelines on valve. We stress that TAVI should be undertaken, indicated, performed, etc., by a hard team. TAVI should be performed only in hospital with cardiac surgery on site. TAVI is indicated in patients with severe AS symptoms who are not suitable for surgery, but who are likely to gain improvement. No need to treat patients who are going to die within one year because of cancer. Also, TAVI should be considered 
in high-risk patients, still suitable for surgery, but where the heart team prefers to go for TAVI because of anatomy or risk profile. And look, for one of the first time in the VAL disease, we have B level. But we strongly stress that today, TAVI should not be performed in patients at intermediate risk. We have to work on that. There are contraindications. We already touched several of them. But in patients who have also a severe primary associated valve disease, for example, severe organic MR, you should go for a surgery. There are limitations, there are contraindications. Analysis, too small, too large. Thrombus, active endocarditis. If a global assessment of the aortic root suggests a risk of coronary obstruction, you should not go mobile plaque, and too small access for arterial approach. There are relative contraindications, bicuspid, untreated CAD, hemodynamic instability, very low ejection fraction, and sometimes inaccessible apex, but it never happens according to our surgical colleagues. Now, we should not forget surgery. Surgery is there. What is new? Exactly to balance what we said for TAVI, if you have a patient who is still suitable for surgery, still suitable for TAVI, at high risk for surgery, but if the heart team favors surgery, surgery should be considered. Now an entity which is very troublesome, the patients with low flow, low gradient, normal ejection fraction, we have to be extremely cautious and treat only the patient who are symptomatic and we are absolutely sure, if we can be sure, that the aortic disease is severe and use MSCT and all tools available to quantify calcium. In the asymptomatic, a lot of debate in the task force, but we are good friends. So we ended up by an agreement, but it's difficult to end up by an agreement here because we don't have strong data supported by effect on survival. Data support effect on even free survival. And we propose surgery to be considered in patients who are asymptomatic, with normal ejection fraction, no abnormality on the exercise test, if they are low risk for surgery, and if they have a very severe aortic stenosis, a progressive aortic stenosis. Surgery may also be considered in this sort of very low risk asymptomatic patient if there is a markedly elevation of natriuretic peptide without other explanation, if there is an exercise echo, a very uh, significant, if it's possible, increase in the gradient, and if there is excessive LV hypertrophy without other cause. So to sum up, we should not forget one entity, it is what should we do with patients CVS, symptoms, contraindications for surgery, short life expectancy. In this patient, we should continue with medical therapy and don't perform the other procedure. So now we finish with aortic valve disease. It's my pleasure to ask Otavio to come and deal with the, the rest of the topic. Thank you. Okay. I will continue with the uh, mitral regurgitation, and particularly talking about uh, indications for surgery in patients uh, symptom who are symptomatic with severe primary or organic uh, mitral regurgitation. The task force uh, wanted to stress uh, a very important point that mitral valve repair is preferable to uh, mitral replacement when it is uh, well feasible and expected to be durable. When mitral valve repair is uh, feasible, surgery should be considered also in patients with a severe left ventricular dysfunction, with an ejection fracture less than 30% and end systolic diameter more than 55. Under these circumstances, if uh, mitral valve repair is not possible, the indication for surgery is uh, uh, much weaker. Even in uh, asymptomatic patients with severe primary mitral regurgitation, surgery can be indicated. Definitely is indicated when we have a left ventricular dysfunction, when left ventricular end diastolic uh, diameter more than 45 millimeter and ejection fractions less than 60. Surgery should be also considered in asymptomatic patients with preserved left ventricular function, a new onset of atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension more than 50 at rest. 
if a mitral repair is possible, surgery should be considered in asymptomatic patients with preserved left ventricular function in case of a flail leaflet um, already with an end systolic diameter more than 40. And surgery in case of uh, 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 mitral repair uh, may be considered also in patients with a left atrial dilatation and in patients with pulmonary hypertension on exercise more than 60 millimeter on exercise. What I just said is summarized in this slide showing the management of severe chronic primary mitral regurgitation. On the left side, you can see the management of patients, of asymptomatic patient. On the right side of this slide, you see the management of a symptomatic patient. Notice that in symptomatic patients with an ejection fraction less than 30%, not candidate for a repair, and also with comorbidities, only medical therapy or extended heart failure treatment is uh, recommended. The indication for mitral valve surgery in secondary mitral regurgitation didn't change too much uh, from the uh, previous guidelines. It is important to point out that uh, surgery should be considered in symptomatic patients with severe mitral regurgitation, even in presence of very severe um, uh, left ventricular dysfunction when the ejection fraction is less than 30% if uh, myocardial revascularization is possible and there is an evidence of viability. If there is no uh, possibility for myocardial revascularization, the indication for surgery is uh, weaker even if the ejection fraction is more than 30%. In regard to the tricuspid uh, uh, disease, uh, there are very specific uh, indication for surgery. This indication can be uh, very clear if uh, there is a severe tricuspid stenosis or is a severe tricuspid regurgitation, either primary or secondary. In the new guidelines, uh, the threshold for uh, uh, secondary tricuspid regurgitation during uh, left side valve surgery has been lowered. Surgery should be now considered in patients with mild or moderate secondary tricuspid regurgitation if the annulus is dilated more than 40 millimeter at the, um, at the um, uh, echocardiographic uh, for a chamber view. The choice of the prosthesis uh, should be very much individualized. And certainly the desire of the informed patient has to be taken into account and certainly respected. However, a mechanical prosthesis in general should be considered in patient age less than 60 in aortic position and less than 65 in mitral position. On the contrary, a bioprosthesis should be considered in patient age more than 65 in aortic position and more than 70 years in mitral position. In regard to indication for antithrombotic therapy after valvular surgery, uh, not so much change from the last uh, guidelines. The only point I would like to stress is that now low-dose aspirin should be considered for the first three months after implantation of an aortic uh, bioprosthesis, and this uh, strategy is uh, better than oral anticoagulation. I would like to show you the loop of knowledge. Actually, um, research and clinical tri trials are creating new knowledge. This new knowledge is incorporated in the guidelines. We made a big effort just to try to incorporate all the new knowledge in our guidelines. The guidelines should provide an educational source for the medical community. And of course, uh, surveys have to be performed in order to evaluate whether the guidelines have an impact uh, on the uh, management of the patient and in the clinical practice. For those who want to know more about uh, the valvular heart disease guidelines, there are two other sessions in this Congress, uh, this morning, later on, and on Tuesday. And finally, I'd like to remind you that there's a pocket version is now available in order to uh, facilitate the dissemination 
of uh, the new guidelines in the cardiological community. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Alec and Otavio, for presenting this guideline to us. It's indeed important to emphasize that there will be two sessions dedicated to meet the task force chairs where all the questions that you have can be addressed directly to the chairs. And it's also important to emphasize that Veronica and her team have indeed succeeded to have for every guideline the pocket guidelines ready. I now have the pleasure to introduce to you Professor John Cam. He um, and the small team did a very early focused update on the 2010 atrial fibrillation guidelines. Thank you very much, Udo. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very proud to represent this uh, small group who have provided a focused update to the 2010 ESC guidelines on the management of atrial fibrillation. We are not performing a duet today, but thought that we might have an octet set the guidelines to music and present it in that way. But we decided against that. Of course, I have conflicts of interest, and they're on this slide. The conflicts are explained in more detail on the ESC website, where you will also find conflicts of interest for all of those who participated in the guideline production. There are altogether 54, including the ESC Committee for Practice Guidelines and the document reviewers. I thank all of them for their assistance. This focused update will deal with several areas. Anticoagulation risk stratification, the use of novel oral anticoagulants, left atrial appendage occlusion or excision, pharmacological cardioversion, particularly with vernicalant, oral antiarrhythmic drug therapy, focusing on dronedarone and short-term therapy, and finally, left atrial catheter ablation. Here are the guidelines, and you can see that the large proportion of new guidelines are related to anticoagulation, either with regards to risk stratification or with regard to novel oral anticoagulants. Since this is a focused update, as you might expect, most of the guidelines are level of evidence A or B. You can see also that since we are dealing with recently approved new drugs for the most part, many of our guidelines are at the level of 2A rather than class 1 because we wish to express some caution about the use of new drugs only recently approved. Before I start on the issue of anticoagulation, we decided to emphasize this guideline recommendation from the 2010 guidelines. It was lost in 2010 at the end of the document, but it is important for two reasons. Firstly, a plethora of new data showing that atrial fibrillation is a marker of high thromboembolic risk, and secondly, our ability to manage that risk. So opportunistic screening for atrial fibrillation in patients 65 years and over using pulse taking and then the electrocardiogram is recommended at a level one. Now dealing with anticoagulation in general, we would like to make risk stratification as simple as possible. And so we recommended at class one level A that antithrombotic therapy to prevent thromboembolism should be recommended for all patients with atrial fibrillation except those who are aged less than 65 and have lone atrial fibrillation or those who have contraindications. Further, 
we would like to say that the choice of antithrombotic therapy should be based on absolute risks of stroke or thromboembolism and bleeding and the net clinical benefit for any given patient. For risk stratification, we continue to recommend the CHADS VASC score as a means of assessing stroke risk in non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Using the CHADS VASC scheme, we recommend at the class 1 level B that a CHADS VASC score of zero should indicate no antithrombotic therapy not even aspirin. We also recommend for those with a CHADSVAS score of two or more at a class one level A that oral anticoagulation therapy is recommended, whether it be with dose-adjusted VKA, a direct thrombin inhibitor, or an oral factor 10A inhibitor. With the category CHADSVAS score of 1, we also recommend oral anticoagulant therapy using any of the three methods mentioned before, but this should be considered based upon an assessment of the risk of bleeding complications and patient preferences. This is a class 2A recommendation, level of evidence A. With regard to patients who refuse oral anticoagulation, we still feel that there is a role for the combination of aspirin and clopidogrel, or less effectively, aspirin alone, at a class 2A level of evidence B. With regard to NOACs, we have two fundamental recommendations the first of which is class 1 level B. When adjusted dose VKA cannot be used in a patient and where oral anticoagulation is recommended, then we recommend at a class 1 level B a direct thrombin inhibitor or an oral factor 10A inhibitor. On the other hand, where oral anticoagulation therapy is recommended, one of the NOACs, either a direct thrombin inhibitor or an oral factor 10A inhibitor, should be considered rather than dose-adjusted VKA for most patients with non-valvular AF based on their net clinical benefit. This is the flowchart that appears in the guidelines. Briefly, those with valvular AF should be treated with a vitamin K antagonist. Those who are young and have low natural fibrillation need no antithrombotic therapy. The remainder should be evaluated using the CHADS-VASC scheme. A score of zero indicates no therapy. A score of two, oral anticoagulant therapy. And a score of one, oral anticoagulant therapy, based on an assessment of patient preference and bleeding risk. Moving then to patients who have high thromboembolic risk but cannot take oral anticoagulants, we recommended at a class 2B level of evidence B interventional percutaneous left atrial appendage closure for patients with a high stroke risk and contraindications for long-term oral anticoagulation. And similarly, also at a class 2B, but level of evidence C, we recommended surgical excision of the left atrial appendage in patients undergoing open heart surgery. Turning now to pharmacological cardioversions, we incorporated vernacalant into a previous class 1 level of evidence A recommendation that when pharmacological cardioversion is preferred and there is no or minimal structural heart disease, intravenous flecainide, propafenone, ibutilide and now vernacalant are recommended.
Further, with regard to Werner Kalent, we said in patients with atrial fibrillation less than seven days in duration in the presence of moderate structural heart disease, but with riders against hypotension, class three or four heart failure, recent acute coronary syndrome, or severe aortic stenosis, that intravenous Werner Kalent could be considered. And lastly, we recommended intravenous Werner Kalent for post-operative atrial fibrillation at a 2B level uh, class, a uh, level of evidence B. And this is the flowchart that appears in the manuscript. Briefly, those patients who have hemodynamic instability obviously need urgent cardioversion, usually electrical. Those who do not have hemodynamic stability have a choice between electrical and pharmacological cardioversion. Those who choose pharmacological cardioversion must have an assessment with regard to underlying structural heart disease. As before, amiodarone is relegated to the drug of last resort where other drugs are available largely because of its slow onset of action. Where there's no heart disease, there's a choice between high-dose oral therapy or intravenous agents. Moderate heart disease is re restricted to ibutilide or vernicalant or lastly amiodarone and severe heart disease only amiodarone. Turning to the choice of oral antiarrhythmic drugs, we recommended dronedarone as an antiarrhythmic agent and we described it as moderately effective, class 1, level A. We also recommended short-term therapy, particularly with flecainide or other class 1C agents for a period of four weeks following cardioversion at a 2B level, level of evidence B, and finally, we stated that dronedarone is not recommended in patients with permanent atrial fibrillation. Again, this is the flowchart that relates to these recommendations. You can see that in minimal or no heart disease, most of the antiarrhythmic drugs can be used, but that amiodarone is relegated until last. In those with significant underlying heart disease, unlike previous guidelines, for heart failure, we recommend only amiodarone. For patients with coronary disease, we place sotalol ahead of dronedarone and that in turn ahead of amiodarone. And for left ventricular hypertrophy, dronedarone and amiodarone. Finally, turning to left atrial ablation, we made two important recommendations. The first with regard to paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We said that catheter ablation should be recommended in this group of patients who have symptomatic recurrences on antiarrhythmic drug therapy who prefer further rhythm control therapy, provided that the ablation is performed by skilled electrophysiologists in experienced centers, class one, level of evidence A, and further we upgraded our recommendation as to first line catheter ablation to a, a class 2A level of evidence B on the basis of two new trials. This is the flowchart showing those recommendations on the left patients with no or minimal structural heart disease divided into paroxysmal and persistent. The paroxysmal fibrillators may opt to go first to catheter ablation. Persistent fibrillators should go through drug trials before being considered for catheter ablation. On the right, patients with structural heart disease, the major decision is, is heart failure present? If heart failure is present and is due to atrial fibrillation, i.e. tachycardiomyopathy, a catheter ablation approach might be preferred by the patient. On the other hand, if heart failure is present not related to atrial fibrillation, we feel that amiodarone should be tried first. On the other hand, if no heart failure is available, we recommend dronedarone or sotalol with appropriate riders. Finally, amiodarone prior to left atrial ablation procedures. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to conclude by hoping that this guideline is not too confusing, like the traffic lights in New York, nor too much of a compulsory nature. Commandments, as you know, are usually class one or more often class three. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this um, excellent presentation of an important guideline. I would like to thank all the speakers and um, all the people who contributed to the new guidelines of this year, and especially the task force chairs, of course, and also Veronica Dean from the ESC. And that concludes the session. <laughs>